Please consult the ticketing counter for assistance. Baggage, baggage, baggage. How many of you have ever traveled somewhere or flown or taken a bus or taken a boat and you've had to carry lots and lots of luggage with you? How many of you only realize that? Now, how many guys do you know like what we can do is we can just throw a bunch of stuff in like a Martin's bag and take it and we're good. Girls are like another story. I've been on trips with y'all, I know. We have to have a separate trailer just for the girl stuff. So, but I understand when we travel, you always travel someone, you always need a suitcase and they come in different sizes. You can have a small one to a big one, whatever you need, you can fit in baggage and you can just take it with you wherever you go. I find one of the most annoying parts of traveling, if you've ever been to an airport, some of you may, some of you may not, but one of the most annoying parts of traveling is that when you have to run to a plane and you got a bunch of stuff that you're carrying, or I used to have to take the Greyhound bus back and forth to college, now I've had a bunch of stuff and I'm running for the bus and it's pulling away and I'm trying to carry all this stuff and it was just horrible. And that, the most annoying part of traveling is really packing and bringing your stuff with you where you go. I know that when we go to camp and we go to all these things, we have a lot of bags to pack. We have a lot of stuff that we have to put away in. And it's so hard sometimes to just, to just get it. But um, what's really funny is, you guys know Altoona is a very you know, unusual place. And um, I have seen some very funny things in Altoona. And uh, just recently, you know, we were out and about and uh, there was this vehicle. And they were uh, traveling down the road, and it was really interesting um, what, what I had saw and how they packed their baggage. <laughs> now I'm really lying, that's not Altoona. But can I tell you that I saw someone last week, they had a minivan, and they had two sofas tied to the top of their minivan. Wrapped with duct tape. <laughs> If you were driving down the road then, I would definitely come and take a picture with you. Because you'd be my hero. What this reminded me of, when I was a kid, one of my favorite movies that ever came out was a goofy movie. It was actually a movie that came out. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about. A goofy movie. And Goofy had to take his son Max on a trip with him and they had to pack up the car. And uh, some of you may have seen this, some of you may not. To me, it's one of the best movies ever that has ever been around. It was part of my childhood. And as you can tell, Goofy was overloading the car with baggage and with things to take with him. And uh, if you remember in the movie, he's driving down the road and he comes to like a little underpass. And when it hits, all the stuff falls out all over the road. And uh, a lot of baggage was lost that day. But what's interesting about baggage and traveling is, is that things do come in so many different sizes. And when I begin to think about this, I was thinking about when you, you know, getting ready to travel and go and do these speaking engagements that I do, that how we travel with baggage. And God really kind of spoke to my heart, and, he, and it was just very plain. It was like, hey, Micah, do you know that you still have baggage that you carry around in your life? I was like, what are you talking about? I, don't, I, I mean, I carry a computer bag around with me, and it has my stuff in it, but really, I don't carry anything else. But God was like, I'm not talking about the physical. I'm talking about the spiritual. And that's when you're just like... Oh. And I begin to think about this, and, and as you know, like, I spend a lot of time just, you know, with you guys hanging out talking. A lot of you guys, we talk on Facebook, or we tweet back and forth, or we Snapchat back and forth, and uh, we, we just, we do life together. And uh, my favorite thing about being in ministry is that, not just being a youth pastor, but building a friendship with you. And the greatest definition that I've ever found of friendship is that friendship is the exchange of life one to another. And that's what it's about. It's about us exchanging our lives one to another. And in part of some, sometimes they will tell you being in leadership and hanging out with you know, a, a generation that's awesome, sometimes there's things that are not so awesome. Because we learn that some of you guys have th had things that have been said to you. And these things that have been said to you have left a permanent baggage type thing on you, a permanent picture, a permanent luggage case. And one of the things that, I, there are certain statements that I hear all the time, is Pastor Mike, I, I, you know, my mom and dad, they told me, that, hey, you know what, I just, I don't love you anymore. Or I heard, I talked to some of you, and with tears in your eyes, you're saying, you know, I'm just, I'm so stupid sometimes, and, and my parents tell me I'm stupid, my teenagers tell me I'm stupid, and, and I just hate it. I've sat with students before in, in counseling, and so with Bethany, 
And we've sat there with you when you have told us with tears in your eyes crying that your parents looked at you and said, I wish you were never born. For some of you, you've been told that you're worthless. That you'll never really amount to anything. And then these things are said to you and you begin to move on with life. And as you move on with life, you begin to understand that all of a sudden, that there is some baggage that comes in your life. And it's an emotional, spiritual thing that comes in. And you think for so long that you can manage it, and for so long that you can handle this thing, and, and that you can do this and kind of take the baggage with you. But as life moves on and, and you want to progress in your relationship with people, the baggage that you have is brought up into relationship with them. You want to accomplish a certain goal, but because of the stuff that's happened in your life, you've taken that baggage with you and you can't accomplish that goal. So for some of you, you want to progress in your relationship with God, but you have hurt and pain that are so deep in you, and you have all this baggage that you carry around and drag through life with you, everywhere that you go. And you can't seem to progress in your relationship with God because your baggage that you have in your life has gotten so heavy. And see, as a teenager, you have a lot of ups and downs. You'll have great days, and then you'll have days when you screw up. And the thing is, is life gets heavy. Life is heavy. That's part of it. And as we progress in our relationship in life with friends and family and with God and, and how things happen, the more baggage that we, we collect and the more baggage we surround ourselves with is the more baggage we have to take with us. And as you progress in the walk of life, life becomes so heavy, you start to wonder if it's even worth going on. Is life even worth living? I've got so much baggage and so much crap that I have to carry around with me. Is life even worth it? Is it even worth it to progress in a relationship? To even have friends? Or is it just easier for me to lock myself in my room behind a computer? For you guys, maybe it's easier for you to sit behind an Xbox and play games and, and talk to people on this and, and play Modern Warfare and do all these things than to go out and face life. Ladies, for you, some of your baggage is so heavy on you. It's just so easy for you to shut down and not let anyone into your life because there's been so much hurt and pain in your life. And I begin to really think about this concept of baggage and how we have to carry a lot of this stuff with us in life. And as we carry these things in life, we have some choices that we can make. Pretty much there's just two choices. Number one is you can keep on going collecting baggage. You can keep on adding to the pile of things that you need to take everywhere with you. You can keep putting more and more bags, and they can be small, they can be medium, they can be bigger, but you can go and you can just continue to collect bags. You can continue to collect hurt, pain, addiction, depression. You can continually collect these things in your life and, and have them, and every time you move on in life, you take all of this with you. That's one choice. The other choice that you have is very simple. You can check your baggage to God. See, when you travel and you go places, they have usually what's called a baggage check, where you take your baggage and you give it to someone and they check it and they say, you know what, I'm going to hold on to this for you. But the thing about that baggage claim is that you always get your baggage back. But see, the Bible says very clearly in Psalms 109, and this is where we're going to start. This is David. Remember, King David, a man after God's own heart, he writes this in verse 22. He says, For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. He says, Help me, Lord my God. Save me according to your unfailing love. For he stands at the right hand of the needy. And I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, okay, this is David, the king that had the riches and the glory and the fame. But yet... David says, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. You know, people, you need to understand, it doesn't matter where you make it in life. You can, be, you can be flipping burgers, to being a CEO, to being the president, to being a king, to being a queen, to doing, uh, being a pastor, to being a garbage man. You can have any profession at any point in this world, but you will never escape the fact that there is hurt and there is pain. That will be in life. You cannot be poor enough to escape it. You cannot be rich enough to buy out of it. Hurt and pain is a very real thing. 
And here we have the king saying, I'm in poor. And I'm needy because of the hurt that is inside of me. This hurt that's inside of me makes me these things. Makes me poor. It makes me wounded. So we can relate because we have been hurt before. We've been wounded before. We've allowed things in life that people have said or done to us hurt us so deeply. But he goes on and, and as he carries his wounds of brokenness and pain, in verse 26 he prays exactly what we're going to talk about tonight. Help me, Lord, my God. Save me according to your unfailing love. Because the good news is this, is that the Lord stands at the right hand of the needy one. Certain seasons of life, you're able to pick up on things. And in certain seasons, you can see when people are in need of a message or in need of a word of God. Where God says, hey, you know what? They, they, some people need to hear this tonight. So tonight, this might not be about you. But it might be about the person to your right or to your left. It might not be about a student, but maybe about a leader. It may not be about the oldest one and the most popular one here, but it might be about the youngest and quiet one here. Tonight's message is for those that are in need. It's an encouragement to those who are having a hard time. Who are struggling in life and, and, and are not able to, to be doing what they want to because they have so much baggage that they're carrying around. They have addictions in their life. There's emotional baggage. There's depression. And we're going to talk about these three things tonight. And we're going to look at these things. My challenge to you is this. That as we progress in this message tonight and we walk down this path, that you look at your life and you examine your life. For one night, for one night, don't talk to the person next to you. For one Tuesday, don't play with your phone. For one Tuesday, just focus in on your life and begin to examine your life. Because my hope is that you're able to acknowledge the things that are within you. The type of baggage that you have that you do not need to take with you, that you do not need to have in your life. So what is your baggage tonight? Is it addiction? Is it hurt? Is it failure? Is it depression? What size is it? Baggage comes in in so many different sizes. But the thing about baggage is that it is something that you take with you. It can be from small to really large. But whatever the size of hurt and pain, of, of addiction, of depression that's in your life, it is going to affect you one way or another. So as you evaluate your life and you look at it, what is it in your life? What is the size of it that's going on? The key, the key verse for tonight is, is this, it's Romans 12 too, and it says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because see, in our mind is where things happen. Our, in our mind is where things begin to begin to take place. And, and in our mind, we see things a certain way. And, and I've talked about perspective before. But in our mind, it needs to be changed. Because in our mind, we accept baggage as truth. And we take it with us as if it was something that we needed to have in our life. But baggage is not needed. You do not need to take it with you. And God says what you need to do is you need to not be like this world and carry around all this garbage, but you need to allow me to transform your mind, to renew it and make it something new in order for me to work in your life. Let me, let me explain it this way. There is a certain, growing up there is a certain room in our house that was one of those rooms where you weren't even allowed to touch anything. And a lot of times my, my job at the house was the vacuum. It was kind of cool because I just set my headphones on and I would begin to vacuum. And I started at a very young age and, and I would just, I'd go in and i start to vacuum. And in my house, where you lived, my vacuuming was like a form of art in my house. If you were to meet my, my mom and my grandma and my sisters, you, you would realize that there is an art form to vacuuming. The way that you vacuum. Now see, in, in Bethany's, in my house, we have a certain rug that you can't vacuum. I went to vacuum it, Ron, since she about tackled me and about knocked me out. Because you cannot vacuum it. 
you have to rake it very nicely and rake it so it doesn't it doesn't mess up. But how many of you might have been like me that when you're vacuuming, you just kind of go like I would put music on and I'll just go sporadically. So when I'm vacuuming, I'm listening to music. I'm not really staying in lines. I'm just kind of going looking for the dirt spots. How many of you are like that? Where you can honestly say that yeah, that is me. I just look for the dirtiest spots and I kind of just hit it there and I just kind of go there and I, and I vacuum, you know, sporadically. It's kind of just how I go. I just want to get it done and that's it. Now, from what I am told, there is a proper and right way to vacuum, where you kind of have to vacuum in like parallel lines, back and forth, and you need to make sure that these lines are consistent and constant, and I know that like, when we vacuum this room, um, Kevin runs the children's ministry, he is very concise, he's very consistent, you can actually see the nice lines in the floor, me, I'm like running with a vacuum around here, running around here, I'm trying to get done, get, I, just, I don't want to do it. Period. I just, I don't want to. But when some of you do it, everything lines up perfectly. Back and forth and back and forth. And then those of you that are above and beyond that, that you vacuum perfectly. And then you go down and you kind of, you kind of do one of these deals. Where you look across the carpet and then you spot it. That little piece of fuzz that you vacuumed over and over again, and it would not come up. So what you do is you go and you get some scissors and a pair of tweezers. And you begin to literally just kind of cut at it. I've seen this done. I'm not lying. I have seen this done. And you begin to kind of just cut at it and pull that fuzz up. And you kind of just begin to viciously attack that fuzz. Like it was taking over your house. Because you wanted it to be clean so well. And I begin to think about this, and I begin to think of when you, clean, when you clean things up, you can do it the way I do it, sporadically, fast, get it done and over with, and just kind of go nuts with the vacuum. Walk out the room and know that there is something left that might have not got picked up. Maybe, maybe I cleaned everything, but I left some dirt spots. And I was going, but you see, the way God is, God is very concise. And when God goes into, comes into your life, He's very concise on how He wants to clean you out. God is not a random, sporadic cleaner. God is a consistent healer. And so when I'm talking about renewing of your mind, I'm not talking about going crazy, like a vacuum and sporadically. I'm talking about that God consistently wants to clean your mind. And He wants to clean you. And He wants, to, wants it to be done right. And He is the one that will go in and say, you know what? Look, Brian, this is in your life. We even need to go in with the scissors and the tweezers and cut this out. And God looks at your life and He says, you know what? This is what's going on in your life, Jake. And I need to cut this out of you. Because you don't need this. And that's how God is. So when God removes your mind, it's a supernatural thing that He begins to do. And it's amazing because that is how God works. God works in a very consistent way in our lives. What we, need begin, what we need to begin to do is to take those first couple of steps to recognize that we have some type of baggage in our life. That we have something that is going on in our life. So tonight you walked in this room. You came down, you said hi to your friends, and then you sat down. You saw all the luggage up front. And you begin to think, what is Pastor Mike going to do this time? And you begin to just go over this. But as you walked in this room, you carried one piece of baggage with you that is very hard for you to get rid of. Go ahead, Dave. about addiction. Because as a teenager, I had a lot of friends who were addicted to a lot of different things. And I began to really think about this. And I'm saying, okay, when was the last time that you heard someone sit down and say, you know what? Today is a great day. It's a great day. And what I think I'm going to do today is I think I'm going to just screw my life up 
completely. I'm going to make the worst decisions that I could ever make today. Decisions that are going to affect me for years. Decisions that are going to cause problems between me and my family, between me and my loved ones. Decisions that are just going to waste all of my money. I just woke up today and thought today was just a great day that I'm just going to screw my life up. When's the last time you heard somebody say that? Because see, nobody, nobody says to themselves on a certain day when they just wake up some one day and say, hey, you know what? Today I think I'm just going to go and I'm just going to buy cartons and cartons of cigarettes and just smoke consistently. Why not? I got nice white teeth, but I think I want them yellow. So when I smile, I look like a school bus with my teeth. That's not a problem. So I'm just going to smoke. And then I used to be a good, you know, soccer player. I played soccer all the way through high school. And I thought it was a great idea to smoke. And I thought it was a great idea to go back out and play soccer. And I quit soccer. I smoked for quite a few years. Cigarettes, yes, I did. And I never planned that it would become an addiction in my life. I was hanging out with a few friends one night, and I go, hey, you want to try a cigarette? Yeah, sure. And then the next day, hey, you want to try a cigarette? Yeah, sure. And all of these things progressed. And then years down the road, I'm struggling to quit smoking cigarettes. See, nobody, nobody really wakes up, goes in the mirror, and says, man, I, I just, I just need to stick my finger in my throat and just throw up everything. Because I enjoy that. You don't wake up one day and have a great day and just say, yeah, I'm going to stick my finger down my throat. Or I'm not going to eat for several days. You don't wake up one day and just look down at your arms and say, hey, I got some really nice arms. I think I'm going to take a razor or a knife out and I'm just going to begin to cut myself. You don't wake up one day, say, hey, I'm going to go jump on the computer and look up porn. Because I've never done it before, I'm just going to go do it. And I'm bored, I mean, hey, I might as well just go ahead and do it. You don't wake up one day and say, hey, you know what, I'm just going to go and I'm going to do some ecstasy and some weed and pop some pills. And I'm going to huff. And I'm going to do all of these things and I'm just going to become a drug addict. See guys, addictions aren't something that you wake up one day to say, hey, that's what I'm going to do. Addiction is a process that happens and goes on. The thing about that, the thing about addictions are, addictions are not like the small bag. It's not just something small that you carry. But as years progress, addiction becomes something that is a lot bigger in your life. And it becomes very heavy. Because you carry it around everywhere you go. And as you take addiction with you, it just gets heavier and heavier. And you, you just add more and more things to it. So as you walk in life, you take addiction everywhere with you. Everywhere that you go. You didn't have plans on having to carry another suitcase with you everywhere that you go. You don't have plans to carry a baggage of addiction with you everywhere that you go. But one thing I know about addiction is it never gets easier. It just always gets harder and worse. But for some of you, because of the hurt and the pain that are so deeply rooted in your life, you thought and you figured, well, if I just find something that will temporarily make me feel better, I can just do it for that moment, that one day, and I would be fine. But the problem is, you, you satisfy, you get comfort for that one day, that one moment. And then the next day, you feel hurt and pain again. You're like, okay, well, I, I feel hurt and pain again, so I'm going to do the same thing again. But then you keep doing it over and over and over and over and over again. See, as a teenager at 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, you can allow the baggage from your past to hold you down and to just weigh you down so heavily that you develop an, a dependency on something that's artificial to try to take care of a problem. But see, the thing about addiction is it doesn't get rid of any of this. It just adds on to it. It adds on to these things. And see, some of, some of you, you're like, well, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do any of that. But maybe you're addicted to Facebook. 
Maybe you're addicted to friendships, the TV. Maybe you're addicted to yourself, thinking that it's all about you all the time. And what's interesting is that no one ever plans to become an addict. Thousands and thousands of people open the door to very dangerous stuff every single day. Listen to me. Every day across this world, people are opening themselves up to addiction. And they're adding on baggage to their life that they don't need to have. What's very interesting is I, I found this scripture in 2 Peter 2.19. For a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. A man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. If you've given your life over to, to partying and drinking and doing drugs all the time, that is what controls you. That is what pushes you forward. That is what alters your thinking. Everything that you do revolves around drinking and partying and doing drugs. If, you're, if you wake up and the first thing that you think about is getting high, it masters you. If going to bed that night, the first thing you think about is getting up and drinking the, on the weekend, it has mastered you. If you're sitting down and you can't get off of your phone and you can't stop texting your friends and you can't stop on Facebook and you can't stop on Twitter, that thing has mastered you. It's very interesting. For a man is a slave. That means it owns you. If all you can think about is, is, is that you're having that, that nicotine fit, and if you, just get, if you just get that tobacco, if you just get that cigarette, if you just get that dip, you will feel better. That has come to control you and your life. We never realize that addictions can become our masters. Because we think that we got it and that we can handle it. But we can't. Addictions can be a major baggage in our life that slows us down from where we need to go. Think about baggages, all of us have some. Different shapes, different sizes. Many, many good people have a lot of baggage that they take in their life. But it's always the, the words that were spoken over us that affect us deeply. Because when things are spoken over to over us, something happens to our emotions. And then when something happens to our emotions, what we begin to do is we begin to take emotional baggage everywhere with us. Check out this clip on it. Because I was stupid. I wasn't good enough. I remember I was in a relationship with a girl who at that time I was in love with. She was what I was all about. She told me, she looked at me and said, you'll never be good enough for anyone, so don't even try. 
As an insecure guy already, that just adds on to the emotional baggage of so much more. And see, emotional baggage is something that we take with us because words are said to us and, and, and it just really gets to us. See, what God wants to do is God wants to silence the negative past that you deal with. He wants to silence it. He wants to turn it off. Because what happens is, is that it is repeated to us over and over and over again. And that's what Satan does. He accuses us of everything that we have done wrong in our past. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brother. See, he can only accuse you of things that you have done in your past. Not what you are doing now, not what you're doing in your future. Satan can only bring up stuff of your past and rub it in your face. The things that you have been hurt in, when people have looked at you and said things to you and cut you so deeply. They looked at you, young lady, and said, you know what? You're not a pretty. You'll never be pretty. You're worthless. All you'll ever be will be an object to a man, and that's it. Young men, you've been told that you, have, you will never amount to anything. You'll never make it in this world, so don't even try it. You're a mistake. You're worthless. Yeah, you're worthless. Your life doesn't even matter. See, these are things that we're told and that have become part of us. And, and we take these with us. Some of the most intense counseling that I have done have been with kids who parents have told them, you're not worthy of my love. You're not worthy of my acceptance. They've been abandoned by the people that were supposed to be the closest to them. And I can see in some of your eyes right now that that's what's been said about you. The same things have been said to you. As I talk about emotional baggage, you're already in your mind replaying vocally the things that have been said to you over and over and over again. You're playing that back in, your, in, in that recording and, and you cannot, you know exactly where you were, the same spot, you knew where everything was and you know exactly what they were saying because that has been imprinted in your mind and you have taken that baggage, that really heavy baggage with you and that emotional hurt and pain has been so intense and so heavy and it's so noticeable, you can't hide it, but it has become emotional baggage that has hung with you everywhere that you go. And you've carried that with you over and over again. Those whose dads have left them for another woman or, or their parents have been divorced all of a sudden wonder, what did I do wrong? It, it, maybe if I would have been better. Because the dad looked at you and said, this is your fault, I'm leaving. Or the mom decides to leave and she says, it's because of your children and because of you. So I'm out the door. It's very hard when you have emotional baggage that's been in your life. And there's a thing that's called a clinger. It clings on. When you hear these voices, the things that have been said to you, it clings on to you. How many of you have ever been out in the woods and you've been kind of running through the fields and as you come home, you realize that something has come to the bottom of your jeans or the bottom, and there's these little run briars that have, that have connected themselves to you. And you didn't know that they were there until you tried to walk normally out on the ground and then you kept getting pricked and you kept getting pricked. And you realize that there was, there was thorns and thistles and things that were connected to you. And it hurt. That's what emotional baggage does. It begins to just pinch and hurt. And the briars begin to just poke you and poke you and poke you. There's a woman that Jesus was talking about in John 4, 17. He had met her at the well and he said, You are right when you say you have no husbands. You have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you are now with is not even your husband. Now see, we read this, and let's just be honest, we're like, what a skank. Is that not what we think? She's a whore. Five husbands, are you kidding me? And that's what we think about her. That's our, that's our viewpoint. 
But then when you go on and you, and you begin to understand, it's very obvious. If she has had five husbands, then obviously something inside of her is longing to be accepted. Something inside of her is longing to be connected with something. I look at this woman and I think, wow, she's no different than a lot of the teenagers that I deal with that jump from girlfriend to boyfriend and girlfriend to boyfriend and, and back and forth and back and forth. Because you're no different. Like her, you're hurt and you're broken. And you're looking for an acceptance in your life. And you have those things that have just clinged to you. And, and, and in your mind, you feel like, well, if I date this person, they will love me and accept me. And, and they will be able to handle all of my emotional baggage. Or you jump and you see a guy who maybe is not a Christian, who does not love Jesus. And in your mind, you say, well, you know what? I can help make them better. When the truth is, you're sinking into a codependent lifestyle that will cost you even more. Because as you enter into a relationship, if this is just your emotional baggage because you've been hurt and you have emotional things that you have not dealt with, you can't imagine what the other person's emotional baggage is. If I were to sit you down and in the spirit begin to just take out of you all of the emotional luggage and baggage and every, all the hurt, all of the pain, all the stuff that has been said and has hurt you, how much baggage would I collect to me? So how heavy it must feel for you to come to this place knowing that you have so much emotional things that are going on. The fact is this, is that when Jesus looked at this woman, he said, you know what, I know that this is happening, but you know what, I know that I, I can set you free. I can release you and I can heal you. Because that's what Jesus does. It's very simple. What Jesus wants to do is he wants to see all of your baggage and he sees all of your emotions. He says, I want to heal that. And I want to cleanse your mind. And I want to touch your life. So we have addiction. That the baggage lines up. Now we have emotional baggage. And now we have what I find to be the most difficult and one of the hardest types of baggage that teenage generation now deals with more than ever. Very interesting. I want you to check out this clip that I found. First time oh, I actually time in the hospital, hospital was four, four, and I was six four, years old. Six years old. Yeah. My brother got killed in a car accident. Car accident. And, my, and my dad left my us. Dad left us. Okay. Yeah, I've died. Yeah, my dad died. I blamed myself. I ended up doing it a lot of teenagers do. I started cutting myself. Thinking that the only way to do it would be suicide. I never actually did it. 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 I stopped. I went to Catholic school for 12 years. And then when that happened, I was like, screw it. Screw it. Maybe I'll try it in a different body. My next life, my next life, I'm going to have so much pain. today that there are 19 guys. It is, it is what goes on. It's a reality that when you go to school, you are going to school with people who are suffering severely with depression. 1,082. 83. 84. 85 people just tried to commit suicide because of depression. Thinking that, you know what, life's not even worth it because I'm so sad and upset. 
and I'm so depressed that I'm just going to end it all. Depression is something that has just come against you. And the thing about depression is it's a silent killer. Because depression, it's like you can't get away from it. You wake up and you're depressed. You go to bed and you're depressed. You're in the lunch line, you're depressed. You sit down at the lunch table, you're depressed. You're around your friends, you're depressed. You come to church, you're depressed. You come to the refuge and you sit here on a Tuesday night and you're depressed. You go out and get on the bus and you're depressed. Then you start to cycle over and over and over again. If I were to ask you, on a survey, how many of you suffer with depression? I think you would be shocked to find how many there really are. The number one response I get from teenagers when I ask how you doing is, Pastor my God, I'm just depressed. Number one answer that I get. Not that, hey, I'm doing great, I'm doing laws, I'm depressed. Depression is an emotional bag. And it's heavy too. And depression is something that, that it comes in and, and we get depressed and we get upset. So what happens is we begin to take another heavy case with us. And depression is in our life. So you not only have an addiction, but then you have emotional baggage. And then you have this depression that follows you everywhere that you go. Your friends know that something's wrong with you, but they don't know really what it is. You don't want them to see it because you put on the smile that you're the happy kid all the time. You're the jokester. But inside, you are so depressed that when you shut the bedroom door at night and lay down, all you do is cry. Because you're so hurt and you have so much pain. On all levels. Depression is, is part of that baggage that you can just, it just becomes so, you become used to it. It's a bag that you're used to having because the world tells you, you know what, for the rest of your life, you'll just have to take these antidepressants and that will help you. That's what the world tells you. That for the rest of your life, yes, you will struggle with depression, but these will, these will help lift your spirits a little bit. I am a firm believer that sometimes we do need medicine. But I know that the greatest medicine is the freedom that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. The greatest medicine is being set free from depression. Set free from these things. Life gets so busy and you get so used to depression that it just keeps going, going, going. And you keep moving on and moving on in life. You have an idea of what you want to do, but your depression keeps you from moving forward. So you turn around and go another way. And you want to go and accomplish this, but depression keeps you from moving forward. So you look at another direction in life, but depression is there. Then it's behind you. And depression has surrounded you where you can't move on with what you want to do in life. Because depression has surrounded you so much that it hits you like a wall every time. You come from home school, you lock yourself in your room, you just hit the pillow, you cry, you sleep. That's all you do. You have no relationship with the world. You have no relationship with God. You have no relationship with anybody. You can't move past it. You can't get by it. You want to be free from it, but you don't know how. Depression is one of the key weapons of the enemy against your generation. Ladies, the same people use depression against you. You're twice as more likely to be depressed. And some of you suffer with that even right now. When your friends are gone and your family's gone, you just, you're depressed. You hate yourself. You hate what's going on. For some of you, you even love Jesus and you're having a great relationship with Him. But you allow a cloud of depression to sometimes overcome you and overtake you. And you don't know what to do. See, depression is a, is a baggage that you don't want to take with you anywhere that you go. Because depression is something that would just haunt you for the rest of your life. What is depression? It's a, it's, it's a fear. Depression is, is a fear of something. It's a sadness about something. 
The Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. The Bible says that I will give you a joy that is so sufficient. The joy of salvation, the joy of knowing me. That when you lay down to when you wake up, you will have a joy that abounds in your life. A happiness. Do we deal with hard situations? Yes. But see, I don't think that a generation of teenagers should be depressed. I think a generation of teenagers should be the happiest group of people. I think that you should go up and you should have fun and you should live in happiness and joy and peace and not have to worry about addiction and not have to worry about emotional baggage and not have to worry about depression. But go out and live your life free of baggage, enjoying life, enjoying your relationship with God. You don't need this stuff. You don't need it. But if you don't give it up, soon you're going to be engulfed in the baggage. And life is just going to get harder and harder. And you're going to have to take more and more things with you.